Monday nights in St. Paul SPNN. The school board needs to take an active role in what the administration is doing in our schools. You cannot continue to relegate authority without oversight of the out of control and do what they want administration. It is business as usual. Still hundreds of thousands of dollars in employees paid time being stolen at taxpayers' expense. First, the district desecrated the senior teachers, teaching staff by creating a hostile work environment and destroying morale, <coughs> age discrimination to reduce wages. You might notice this lawsuits that were mentioned in the paper. Over the last few months, St. Paul schools went after the most qualified, most experienced, most productive senior building engineers and drove them out by use of threat of firing and discipline, just like was done to the senior teachers. These engineers, of course, are the people who make sure individual school buildings run and are safe for our <coughs> children and teachers. Now the district is having to promote engineer twos to be head engineer fives to run our buildings. This is like the district having teacher's aides or student teachers be in charge of the classroom or teachers be principals. Now we hear of safety reports being dummied up, medical reports being altered, the cover up of mold and asbestos in the schools, district employees being off on medical and emotional leave and the Environmental Protection Agency and the Occupational Safety and Health Agency investigating the district. This Wednesday on Inside Insight, I will also fill in the rest of the superintendent's editorial. She entitled State of the District. I call it the true cost of reform in St. Paul. Thank you, and from the employees who we, you have driven out, Merry Christmas. Our next speaker is Paul Johnson. <clears throat> All right, we're trying to finish setting up the set around here. All right, so we can expand on that, and I want to expand on that in relationship to the uh, superintendent's uh, Valeria Silva's, uh, she calls it the uh, state of the district, uh, fruit of reform in St. Paul, and it's really the cost of reform in, in St. Paul. Strong schools, strong communities, SSSC, Soviet-style systemic control. That's really what it's about. It's about central planning. It's about uh, no longer will the have, will you have site-based decision-making? It'll all be done from, from downtown. The, uh, you know, what's interesting, actually, in today's paper, the superintendent <clears throat> gets a 2% pay raise, and uh, that's on top of her $180,000 salary. And so I guess, you know, it's interesting in the same paper, same Sunday, uh, this is from the corporate newspaper, the uh, 11th of December, uh, Joe Sushri. We have no evidence of restraint on the part of the school board and the city. To them, a cut is merely not an increase in their spending. If there is no evidence of restraint, <laughs> see, you, you understand that? There's, there's uh, a cut to them is that they don't increase it. Well, but they do increase it. And the government used that line, well, they want to increase it 50%, but they're only going to increase it 25%, so therefore they took a 25% cut. That's the game they play. Um, Yes, and if there is no evidence of restraint, there is no reason for us to believe that these annual increases are sustainable. It talks about the rainy day fund. Um, legislature cut back or eliminate entirely local government aid. That's wonderful. These units of government 
whether it's the county, the city, the school district, they all live off of this free money. Of course, where does that free money come from? It comes from you, the taxpayers. And when it's this free money, how do you hold them accountable? Because they don't have to come to you, the taxpayer, the voter, to get into your, your billfold, your pocket purse. So this, once we can get the funding back at the most basic level, we can start to get a handle on this. What we should be worried about is the viability of the city. Ask yourself this, would you advise your children to settle in St. Paul and raise a family? The answer for many of us is disturbing. It compels a great sadness. It is a sad thing to live in a city that so many now wish they had not committed to. Many homeowners are in a position to walk. They can sell or rent their houses. They can move to Washington or Dakota counties where the government just isn't big enough yet to drain them. <laughs> a punishing cycle of, of property tax increase so that the public class and those dependent on it might remain well fed. Folks, that is it. That is it. Think of the government class, those, the public class, the a punishing cycle of property tax increase so that the public class and those dependent on it might remain well fed. You couldn't drive those people out with a cannon. There isn't a corporation in the world that sends us a bill twice a year for whatever they want. You know, whether it's the school district, whether it's the county, whether it's the city, that's exactly, exactly where it's at. Now, let's, let's jump to the superintendents. And, you know, because we have so much, some of this is, is going to uh, stay for next, next week. And St. Paul Community Schools, as they do in magnet schools, and second, St. Paul neighborhoods are far more naturally integrated than most cities. This goes back, first, students of color do as well or better in St. Paul community schools as they do in magnet schools. And second, St. Paul neighborhoods are far more naturally integrated than most cities. Back 15 years ago, the Republican legislators we're going around the, the state holding a forum. And I remember that was when out there on, off of Rice Street, just uh, frontage road along Highway 36, was the first, one of the first uh, tri-district schools. And uh, one of the legislators asked super, Superintendent, then Superintendent Gaslin from the North St. Paul School District, why would students come to this school, choose to go to this school? Because it was a special process. And uh, the answer was because of what the district, what the school offers. Has all these special programs, enrichment programs, on and on. And the uh, legislator said, well, if it's good for this school, why isn't it good for all the schools? See, that was, that was the game that was played. That was the game, the incentive that was played to create these special little uh, schools that the parents that really were on top of their education, children's education, knew how to move their children through the maze. And I had said from, from day one, all you have to do is make all the schools good, make them the same, and all the parents have to do, especially in the inner city, is get their children up in the morning, feed them breakfast, that isn't the role of government, and send them to school. So, 
Two simple indicators bear this out. Achievement and enrollment, both are up and in numbers that we haven't seen in years. Well, you know, isn't it interesting that they don't put the numbers? They don't put the numbers, and I'm gonna challenge every one of you. The, the St. Paul School District has a budget uh, of uh, 636 million dollars. 636 million dollars for 39,000 students. That's over, divide that out, that's over $16,000 a student. And uh, for that kind of money, you go on their website and try to find just something as simple as these numbers. Their enrollment, the number of students they have this year, last year, the year before. Find the budget numbers. Just see how much money they're spending. Just do some simple things. Try to go on their website and find that information. And you'll see how impossible it is. And this is what you get for, this is an example of why the $180,000 a year superintendent is rewarded with a 2% increase. Did you get that? Did you get 180,000? And does the 180,000 count her benefits? <laughs> Folks, you know, it's, it's, really, uh, it's really something else. A second ind indicator of our momentum is enrollment. This fall, we experienced the first overall enrollment increase in 12 years. This thing has been going down. Now, I challenge you to find what their enrollment increase was. Earlier this year, the superintendent told us she was going to balance the, the budget at St. Paul schools by bringing in 10% additional new students. That would be 4,000 students. That was, she was gonna balance the budget with free money from the state. Well, did she bring in four? Did she bring in 3,000? Did she bring in 2,000? Did she bring in 1,000? No. Maybe 100, but find the number, find the number. So that's why they don't, she doesn't put this number in here. So when, when you real, realize what's going on here, the whole, this whole article is about self-promotion. The trend is promising. This is the second year in a row where actual enrollment beat our projection. What were their projections? <laughs> three, four hundred dollar, three, four hundred student decrease? So if they're projecting a four, four hundred dollar, or four hundred student decrease, if, if they only had a 390 <laughs> student decrease, it beat their expectations. Isn't that wonderful? No numbers, no numbers. Oh boy. State and growing enrollment helps us to stay on course with our academic plan because stable enrollment provides stable revenue from the state. That's what it's all about. This approach, while providing assurance for families, also leads to greater equality and fiscal accountability. Fiscal accountability? Did you hear what I said to that board? Hundreds of thousands of dollars walking out the door and they don't do anything about it? Is that fiscal accountability? This student-centered budget results in fewer cuts to schools. Student-centered budget. What, aren't those great terms? Those are great terms. To keep class sizes stable. What are, cla what, what are class sizes stable? Is that 30 per room? Talk to the teachers. 28 per room? How would you like to be teaching a bunch of out of control, inner city, 
first and second graders and have 30 kids in your room. But it's keeping class size stable. In other words, it's 30 this year, it was 30 last year, it'll be 30 next year. Maybe 28. It, ab it is about providing access to the most rigorous AP calculus classes. What's AP? Advanced placement. I think it's insulting to people when they use these little inside uh, abbreviations. Do you, advanced placement, by its own definition, is for the special students that are accelerating. And so, not e if everybody receives the same level of education, it wouldn't be advanced placement. It would just be placement. You know, folks, you need to read this stuff. Here it's mentioned somebody that, that received, uh, Arthur Reynolds received 15 million invest in innovation. Isn't it interesting? You can receive $15 million to figure out how, how, how to uh, be innovative in, in teaching. Rather than just make it work, we have to pay <laughs> folks, 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 folks. So, you know, the proof is in the pudding. You know, I just wonder if there's, there's, there's something in the water. And, uh, uh, it well, do we we have a caller? Let's let's take the call. Caller, we want one calls on on the school district right now. Otherwise, we're going to put you on hold. Is this with the school district? All right, keep my pardon. Let's play it. Let's play it. It is about the school district. I got a comment for you. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead, caller. The comment is, I love the way the school district lies to the public out there all the time about uh, the fact that your taxes are not going to go up. If your property values go up, you, in fact, are going to start paying more to the school district. And they can't tell the people out there, you know, that it's not going to go up because mine went up a heck of a lot. I'm just so upset about the fact that people don't see this fact of, you know, they tell you all the time how to live, you know, within your means and watch how much you spend, the school, the state, the, all these different uh, government entities. The city is going to be charging everybody more, the state's going to be charging every bo everybody more, and it's probably going to end up that the federal government's going to be taking more money out of your pocket, too. 2012 is going to be no picnic for anybody out there. All right. I just I wish people would have voted down that referendum for the school district. They don't teach the children the way they should be in the first place. Well, that... And and that's what St. Paul is. It, all this this. Uh, if you're not uh, a self-starter, forget it. All this is about uh, taking and um, uh, preparing for the next uh, for the next uh, levy and trying to promote this wonderful this reinvention of the wheel. Every every time they change superintendents, it's the world has has now seen the light, and we will now move out of the dark ages. <laughs> and then we have to come in with 100. Tell them to start living within their means and stop spending money they don't need to. Well, you know, the other thing is, is this business of enabling bad uh, parenting. And, you know, they talk about uh, the, the need, and it is a need, for early childhood education. And... Uh, Parents send their kids, especially in St. Paul, you wonder why people leave. Why, why does the superintendent live in Woodbury, St. Paul schools? You know, like, like Joe Sussery said, people can, can move. They don't have to stay there. And so when, you, when the teachers are confronted with these kids that come in that are not prepared, and now it's, it becomes government role to pre-K education, feed the kids, uh, teach them the alphabet, things that the parents were supposed to be doing. And now the, the, the government, the taxpayers, remember what the, the communists used to say? Give us the minds of the children. That's all you need. 
Don't have the parents educate the children, have the state educate the children. And let's get the parents out of the equation. And let's, let's enable bad behavior and bad discipline. All right, let's, uh, let's, we're going we're gonna to continue this next week on this. We just have too much, and we're going to run out of time here. All right, we have the next clip ready to go. Let's go. I think this is Grant. What do we have? Just play it. We'll see I'd what like it is. I'd like to congratulate publicly John Nephew for serving four years on the city council. And I would like to congratulate Rebecca Cave for finishing third in the election. And also Beth Sletton for her uh, involvement in the primary. Little did I know that when I met John Nephew on February 3rd, 2007 with his wife Michelle and Pete Fisher, that I'd be sued by him four years later. Uh, Cardinal, we yes. don't allow you to speak directly to individual council members here, okay. and so all your comments need to be addressed to the council as a whole. Okay. And so if you'd please follow that rule. Okay, I'd like to... Uh, uh... All right, Bob Cardinal, as, as of January 1, he's a council member. <laughs> You see, you see the, uh, in, in his own words, in his own words that came from the lips of Billy Rossbach, the idiot and the buffoon. So as a council member, he's still not allowed to use the names of current council members or of city administrators. Isn't that wonderful? Folks, you know why you need to get rid of those people up there? Now we've shifted to Maplewood. Now, you know, two things. Finally got rid of John, Johnny Nephew. Johnny Nephew, of course, we can't find out if he had any, a real job other than selling those satanic card games to children and living off the dole as a city council person. So now we're, we're hearing out there on the street that He's, he's there, there, the system is looking at either getting him a consulting job with Allied Waste or getting him on the payroll of Maplewood, the city of Maplewood. Johnny doesn't have any real jobs. And they had a nice going away party for him, but nobody showed up except <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the cronies up there, the city manager and the other council people and his wife. And of course, they had a cake. Of course, you bought the cake. And uh, that started at 6.30 Monday. And wouldn't you think they'd leave that cake out for the, uh, the citizens? No, they, they took, it, took it home, sent it home with, uh, with uh, Johnny's wife. And, uh, you know, anytime there's free food, like the free food that they get in the back room, of course, the council has the free food catered in, and they make sure they order way plenty, probably twice as much as they need, so they can always take free food home. So it's also going to cut into Mr. Nephew's, uh, um, you know, food budget. And it's also, see, now that he, he, he's not on the council anymore, he won't get to have free cable and internet and everything that came through the cable commission. Boy, he's really taken, he'll have to actually go get a real job. You know, when you look at Mr. Nephew and they try to put out these accolades on him, the truth is that if you li really listen to some of the things he says, they're distortion and lies. So it, it was really, a re I have to commend the Maplewood voters for having gotten rid of one of the problems up there. They only have four more to go, and that will come. And, of course, Bob Cardinal on there. So, um, and Mr. Nephew, of course, just like uh, Marv Copen, typical DFL, they use any kind of little campaign gimmick to sue their opponent to try to silence them. And you know what Mr. Nephew did? Mr. Nephew sued Bob Cardinal because one of the trash haulers who, who actually wants to protect their own business sent out 
some ca campaign literature to support Bob Cardinal. So Mr. Johnny Nephew, rather than campaign on the issue, tried to, to turn it and make it a, a violation of the, uh, the hauler's right of free speech and uh, sue Mr. Cardinal and try to disparage him that way. That's who you have there in Mr. Nephew. I hope we never see that guy again in an elected office. You know, we've, we've heard also, and this was reported to me from one of the, a citizen that was told by Peter Fisher, of course Peter Fisher is, is on one of the commissions up there, and he's the campaign manager for uh, Billy Rossbach, and that uh, the comment that was credited to Peter Fisher was that uh, Mr. Rossbach is an embarrassment and the DFL doesn't want to see him run again. Well, I think they have that right, that he is an embarrassment. He's an embarrassment to the city and he's an embarrassment to the DFL. All right, let's, uh, let's finish up with Bob Cardinal's comments. The uh, council people in front of me, Karen Guilfoyle made a nice comment to me when I was defeated in Mr. the primary. Mr. Cardinal, you also can't directly address the staff. Okay, it's nice comments, positive comments. I, I don't care whether it's positive or negative. Okay. Congratulate Allied Waste for uh, taking their garbage to Newport. That's a positive thing. And I'd like to ask, is all garbage going to be taken to Newport? Mr. Cardinal, your comments are okay, just to the council. Okay, it'll be just a, a comment. I hope that, that uh, follows through. St. Paul, Badness Heights, and White Bear Lake all reported that their garbage haulers own the carts. I'm not going to bash you, but I'm going to tell you that when I served with you uh, as mayor for six years, you, you served on the council the following two years, uh, my last two years, and I will be polite to you and I will treat you with respect. I want you to know that. I and he was gracious to, uh, to welcome me and I will look forward to working with you and I will. About our uh, findings well, of fact. That goes right to, right to the heart of the, the, the issue that uh, Mr. Rossbach and that whole council does not treat citizens. You see it. We play it every week. Does not treat the citizens, the taxpayers with respect. And the person that's most intolerable is James Lanus, the one that, that's up there constantly constantly hammering that people have to be tolerant of his, him and his lifestyle. We're going to play a clip now and show you just how intolerant that guy is. Let's, let's play the next clip. Do we have the next clip on... Uh, uh, findings of fact regarding to the uh, horse taking of private property. And, you know, there seems to be something going on in the air, not only here, but Ramsey County and the Vikings and, and uh, down at the Capitol, whatever. It was this whole thought process of lack of freedom of association. And, uh, and here, even freedom of speech uh, seems to end content, controlling the content of that speech uh, beyond any means necessary. Uh, is just uh, baffling to me uh, that this is taking place. And it's part of the neo-Marxism that's going around. And when we take the, the, the right of freedom of association and we say, no, you can't associate, you can't give your property to certain people to dispose of it, um, it it's, it's amazing to me. And this whole concept, neo-Marxism concept of sustainability, which is goal is to take away your liberties. You know, the one responsibility you have, and the easy one, is make sure people don't pollute. You know, that, that's an easy one. Make sure trash haulers don't pollute. 
uh, you had you had the opportunity when uh, you told trash haulers, hey, uh, here's your rates, you got to publish your rates, and they need to be this. It was your responsibility to hold them accountable to those, and and you did not hold the city staff accountable to that, and then you tried to blame it on the trash haulers. And the city game, I know the game that you're playing. And so what I want you to know is that the sustainability, neo-Marxism, the goal is to take away liberties. And this organized force taking a property, private property, is, is one of those goals. And congratulations, you, you got it through. But also this was not an election issue from the prior election. It was then you need to listen to the people. And your findings of fact that put the economy and the cost of collecting uh, private property as number one was not the number one issue. The people spoke out loudly and clearly. They wanted the choice to choose the trash haulers. I got the copy of the, all the names that people sent in and what they wanted to see. And in, in the meetings, it was freedom of choice in relationship to who they wanted for their uh, trash haulers. And that's not what came up in the findings of fact. That findings of fact is a fraud. But the well, it's wrong. You didn't listen to the people, and the people had an election, and uh, uh, Mr. Nephew uh, lost, and it was a message, and it was a message ignored. You didn't have to vote the way you did at, uh, for this organized taking of property. You didn't have to. You could have waited. You could have had more input, but you chose not to. You sped through the process and didn't look for other alternatives to say, hey, how do we keep the freedom of association going? How do we keep local businesses into our area at the same time keeping things uh, so people don't pollute? And there, there uh, so the priorities are wrong. The One of the things that is really. All right. That, that part of that meeting was it was finding of facts with the uh, with the uh, government run trash hauling. And we have Lauren Setterstrom with us now, too. Finding of facts, what they should have included in the finding of facts is the fact that the decision had been made to have government trash hauling before the process even started. That the whole thing was a dog and pony show. It was done because the, the state law says you have to go through these steps. They went through the steps knowing, knowing the outcome had already been determined. The end justified the means. And so why didn't they put in the findings of fact that that is really what happened. Why didn't they put in the finding of fact that the committee that moved this forward only had people on it that were chosen because they supported government trash hauling? It didn't have any of the haulers on it. It didn't have any of the citizens that were against it. Why don't they put true findings of fact? Even that is part of the charade up there. So now I we're going to play James Lanus, and James Lanus is the person that does not want to be tolerant of other people. You heard Mr. Kin Kinley speak. Was anything he said outrageous? But now listen to how he's berated by Mr. Lanus. This is why people tell me, Bob, we don't want to go up there before our government because the way citizens get treated. We see the way they treat you. And we can't handle the way, the things you are able to handle. And so we're going to stay away from government. But come election time, we're going to get rid of those thugs and those bullies. And those uh, Billy Ross box and, and Jimmy Lanus and we got rid of Johnny Nephew and well we got to get rid of Kathy Dingy. Okay, 
Let's play the last thing one. that I've learned over the last two years is there are dedicated people like yourself and then there are disruptive and dysfunctional people that are out in the hallway who come into this chamber every day and tell us that the sky is falling, that we're somehow creating this, what was it, neo-Marxism, just these great terms. And, and I just think when you look at somebody that's sane and rational and insightful and that can talk about the circumference of a tree and it was missed by two millimeters, the level of calipers. depth, calipers, thank you, right? Mm -hmm. But th that's my point. <laughs> All right. There, you see how, how, he, how Mr. Linus is, puts down Mr. Kinley? What, what word did he use? Disruptive? And what, what was the other word he used? Anyway, all right. We got, uh, we're going we're gonna to switch over to Grant now. We have too much to move into. Let's get Lauren on the camera here. There's Lauren. And I think you're on camera number two over there, or three over there. Well, I'm on one, on. and we're both on two. You know, it reminds me, who's on first, what's on second? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that, the old baseball thing. Yeah. Yes. Well, it was very interesting, the, the, the truth and taxation meeting. It was also very interesting. For Grant. For the city of Grant, and also very interesting, the council meeting. Uh, you one know, the, uh, let me stop there. Uh, John Wyckoff was up two weeks in a row asking Mr. Mr. Billy Rosbach, ma mayor, what's the debt of Maplewood? He said, I don't care. I don't know. I don't know, and I don't care what the debt is. That was his comment. Just like when he went into the back room, and one of the citizens out in the hallway said, Mr. Rosbach, you're supposed to be representing the people. And you know what that arrogant guy said? He said, I don't represent the people, I represent myself. Folks, that's what you have. He represents himself, he doesn't represent you. He sounds like he's a little closer to Mussolini than uh, George Washington, that's for sure. <laughs> All right, but compare that to, to at least Grant. Grant, that's one thing we'll give them credit, they, they do listen, they uh, public comment. Uh, I think on my show I put it out. Steve Bonin very eloquently stated when council Bob, person, council person, when Bob Tufty, the planning commission member, said we shouldn't let anyone that isn't in the city of Grant comment, and he eloquently disagreed and said anyone that pays taxes in the United States should be allowed to speak. If you have a business in Grant and you live elsewhere, you should speak. If you live in Hugo and you drive through Grant and you have an issue with the roads, you should be able to speak. Taxpayers should be able to speak their mind. And, uh, because all these cities take federal and state money. That's right. And uh, so from that standpoint, I think you did a very excellent job of comparing Grant and Maplewood when you got up to the Truth and Taxation meeting. Should we play some of that? Sure, let's play that. Let's, let's, are we ready with that next one at the 24-minute mark? Well, get it up there. Okay. Get it up there. They're going to get it up. And, and I think uh, that's one of the things that and you made a very bold comparison that the, the geographically Grant is much larger. Pretty near twice as large twice, as Maplewood. Twice, but it, it is self-sufficient. A, a million dollar budget instead of a uh, 43 million dollar budget. I mean, no, no debt. And, that, and they have a, what, an 80, what, 82 percent reserve? Yep, 80, yep, 82 percent reserve. Maplewood has a 90 million dollar, 90 million dollar debt. debt. Mr. Rosbach, if you watch the show, which we know you do, you would be, uh, <laughs> you would know these figures. All right, let's, let's play, let's play it. This was, I was out on the road this day, and so. Good evening, uh, I'm not dressed, Mayor, uh, Council, of course, I'm Bob Zick, um, and I do host Insight Insight 8.30 to 9.30 on Wednesday, and I say that uh, because that is where I get the background watching the different units of government, especially the cities. And uh, also I want to make sure that you may or know that I have a uh, property and financial interest in Grant. Now, with Larry Lanoue just having spoken to you, I think the uh, Matamidi School District should be re renamed and call it the Grant School District in as much as 
what's left in Matamita? Any schools? It's Wildwood? Where's Wildwood? Everything else is in Grant. The only thing that's left in Matamita is what I'll call the corporate office. That's like a corporation having their corporate offices in the Bahamas for tax purposes. So I just add that in here. Um, truth and taxation, the only reason I knew this was tonight is because I happened to go on the website and I saw it. So I don't know that these truths and taxation meetings get uh, out to the public that they know that this is happening. And, uh, but I do want to commend the city of Grant for running a frugal operation and this council for being open to listening to the citizens. Now, um, I didn't see a copy of the whole budget here. I want somebody to correct me. What's the whole budget? 923,000? Uh -huh. Is that, am I close there? Sharon's has her more powerful glasses on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, total levy, uh, $938,570. Okay, $938,000. All right. Um, a correction, that's the levy, that's the but that's levy. not the budget. No, that's the levy. Total expense budget is proposed at $1,164,106.28. Which is less than this year. <coughs> okay, the, uh, so the money that's going to flow through the city is going to be the one million or the nine thirty eight. One million. The, 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 the levy amount is how much we need to subsidize the operation. The other, the rest of it comes from uh, fees, permits, uh, revenues, All right. All other right. revenues. Okay. So depending on how you use that number um, and the number of residents and. When I look at other cities' operations and, and how they balloon their budget and extract taxpayers' money, that's why I commend the city of Grant. And I'm going to make a comparison between, because last night I was at the Maplewood <laughs> City Council um, budget truth and taxation meeting. And, and I shared this with them. Maplewood is four miles away from here. Maplewood has a budget of 43 million. Um, Maplewood is 19 square miles. <coughs> Grant is 36 square miles. Your budget is comes down to about $600 per household. Their budget comes down to $4,300 per household. Huge difference, huge difference. Now, uh, the mayor over there, Billy Rosbach, took a shot at Grant last night and said, yeah, but, you know, there's more horses and there are people there. And to that I would say there's, in Maplewood, there's more bureaucrats and criminals and thugs than there are horses in Grant. So We don't look at that horse count as a shock, though. Just well, it, no, I, I realize okay that, but the way he yeah. said it, yeah. I... I, I I, when I refer to that, I think it's, it's a, a plus, yeah. you know, and to that end, his own brother <laughs> lives over on 107th and Juliet and happens to live on a paved road. You know, you talk about the roads, um, uh, your road commissioner, who's the road commissioner? Steve. Steve. <laughs> Steve. All right. You're anonymous over there. <laughs> and, and I know people say that, that the roads are, are well kept up here. I want to sh share something because the Maplewood mayor also disparaged, <laughs> well, yeah, it's all gravel roads. Well, it's not because his brother lives on a paved road and, and I don't know what the percentage breakdown is. But you, when you look at Maplewood, they have a proposal there for um, what they call living streets. I call it deadly streets. That's where they're trying to, with the watershed district, narrow the streets because the pavements are impervious and they want to restrict the amount of water that runs off and doesn't grow in. Well, Grant, <coughs> to that extent, is light years ahead by having gravel roads that retain the water. So, you know, it's kind of like you don't have to reinvent the wheel like Maplewood is doing. 
So when we go through this and I look at it and Maplewood has a $90 million debt. Grant is what, zero debt, I uh, believe? Yeah, for the most part, yeah. yeah. Right. And, and what do you have, about a 40% reserve? 80, no, 82. 82. So instead of 90, 90 billion in the hole, you're actually solvent. So um, I look at it and say it's very good. I, I do see a slight room to, when I look at the budget and, and look at some of the other um, conversations that go on. Okay. The, uh, all right, there's more to that, but well, Warren, how, what percentage paved roads in grant? 53% and 47% gravel, uh, and they actually want to keep them that way. One of the reasons, of course, is uh, a, it slows traffic, and B, there, uh, there's a lot of uh, recreational activities. We're talking runners, you're talking horseback riding, and this is very conducive to those activities, having gravel roads. <clears throat> In addition to the environmental aspect, where it's, everything's not running off, it's, you know, yes, it'll, uh, water will run off a gravel road, but not as rapid as an asphalt road, and uh, it, it is just better for the environment. And what do they put on the... Uh on the gravel roads now to eliminate dust. Calcium chloride. Calcium chloride to, to uh, you're on that camera over there. Okay. And so, you know, folks, look, look at the difference. Look at where that council meeting is held. We Lander School. Yes, it probably was made in 1910, I believe. It's an old uh, elementary one, school. Old one room elementary school. And later on, I'll talk about how that uh, they, there was room to save about uh, that uh, Grant has one employee, only one employee, everything else is contracted out. Even with, with, with that great record, they could still save, uh, uh, what it was, 8,000 on yeah, a- 8,000 if they used the, got a different city planner from the same engineering firm, firm. that we have the engineer. And they could save another about 1,500 a year if they got quit having to rent a, a, a satellite, a satellite and they could put an actual toilet and a drain field in the redone uh, lower area of City Hall. Mm -hmm. So even with that, and they operate so frugal, and then you look at things like the St. Paul School District, 600 and, what was it, 38 million, and Maplewood, 50 million a year, and, and uh, uh, 90 million in debt, and then you look at the county, and. And then you look at the state, and then you look at the federal government. Folks, if they all, you know, when you talk about quality of life, <laughs> when, when I read that business about, that Joe Sustri said about people walking away, why wouldn't you? Four miles, four miles from Maplewood, you're in a city that, <laughs> that operates at, at $600 a household. With zero debt. debt. With zero mm -hmm. debt, 82% reserve, instead of in a, in a city that's $4,300 per household and $90 million debt in a $50 million budget. Folks, it's a no-brainer. I know people, well, John Wyckoff is one. He's, tr um, Joanne Parsons, they're trying to sell their place and get, get out of Maplewood. People, and you know the problem is they're locked in because nobody wants to move in. Nobody wants to buy their place. Well, that's, it's a problem. The market is down. The other interesting aspect with this too, if you compare the, and you had already touched this, compare the, the city uh, you know, uh, <coughs> council area, meeting area. Grant uses his old schoolhouse. It's not a Taj Mahal. Look at what Maplewood has. Maplewood's also going through this area where they're uh, you know, shutting down police stations, opening it, you know, and it, it's this building frenzy where they're trying to make these Taj Mahals all over the place, making some type of statement, you know, in, well, it's, it's, it's not a functional building, it's, it's some architectural what, it's, what statement. Is it, is it Invergrove that, uh, am I right with that, the Invergrove down there where, where they're trying to build that big, uh, where everybody is, is up in arms about the, the big million, 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 Cottage Grove. Cottage Grove, I'm sorry, it's down in Cottage Grove where, you know, they're trying to do the same thing down there, just like the Montamina School District. 
We want, we want this big high dollar complex. We want 27% open, open enrollment. enrollment. And, I, and I know that, that, that you and Larry Lanoue and others are, are working with the legislature trying to have the state now rein in that kind of approach that, you know, state average is 4%. There's only two districts in Minnesota that, as I understand, currently are above the 4% of open enrollment. Edina is one, and Matamida is the other one. And now they're, it's kind of interesting because now they're, they went from number second to like number 10th, their rating went because of the open enrollment because all these kids come in and they don't have a school identity. They're, hey, I'm, I'm from a stranger from Stillwater, I'm from White Bear, wherever it is, and they're losing ground. Well, yeah, that's gonna happen, plus, the last figure I saw, it went from $10,800 to educate a student. The last figure I saw was $12,400. Well, if they're only getting $6,000 from the state, that means instead of going on the whole $4,800 per kid, it's now $6,400. Well, it's still not as bad as St. Paul with $16,000, over $16,000. You know, I wanna, right here I want to add, yesterday, Brooklyn Center School District held a special election for, for a school board member. Why didn't they hold that in no, on November 8th? Special election for school board, well obviously this is what the districts do to, tr to set this, this thing up to skew the outcome. 700 people voted, 700. They could have had it in November. That's your Brooklyn Center school district. These school districts are, are corrupt. The other issue that I want to say is, is in tomorrow's paper, David Schultz, who ran for Ramsey County attorney, is over at Ham, Hamlin uh, College, Hamlin University, and uh, he led the fight. You know, he, he the, N, NPR or tried to use him as a uh, supposed neutral commentator on issues. Well, he, he is so partisan. So he led the fight to stop Emmer from teaching a business class out there. And I know some groups said, you know what, it's good for a university to have these total polarized, opposite divergent positions. And that even though, and you know, I'm, I'm not a, a lover with Tom Emmer, but you know, we need to, to mark David Schultz for who he is. Uh, so tomorrow, I'll uh, find that. All right, what, do we have anything coming up? We're down to a minute here in Grant. Well, no, they're not going to have a, I just got an email today. We're not going to have a planning commission meeting, so the next one will be the January meeting, and we'll see what happens there because that is the appointment schedule, and we'll see what they do with that. It'll be very interesting to watch that. And it's going to be, like Lake Maplewood, it's going to be interesting to see the outcome of the next election. Oh. That, that you know, people, it takes, takes a while, but people have caught on to Maplewood. They've, they've caught, caught on to the, the Billy Rossbox, the James Lannis, the Kathy Dingies, the, uh, the Marv Copens, the, uh, you know, Marv Copen, he voted, he voted against the uh, trash, government trash hauling, but then he voted for the budget to, to, to implement it. All right. I'm your host, Bob Zick, Lauren Setterstrom. Thanks for coming out again, Lauren. We'll be back next week. Media Center. Uh, what else do you need to know? Well, ultimately, you have to be over the age of 18. You also